Welcome to Win the Agile Spirit by giving an amazing software demonstration and gain funding for your projects. Hi, I'm Heather Cole, Analytic Advisor at Lodestar Solutions. And today I'm gonna to share with you how you can look like a rock star by doing a great software demonstration. Now this is a presentation that I originally gave at Think 2019, the IBM conference. Unfortunately, the recording of that presentation, the sound quality was not exactly stellar, so I'm re-recording this. So it's not gonna be quite the same as the live event, but I'm gonna definitely share with you the concepts so that you can look like for those of you that don't know me, I've been in the software industry for over actually 30 years, but I don't wanna admit that. My parents had a software company years ago, and my dad wrote some of the first software code to track the futures market in a real time basis. So as a teenager, my job was to travel to the Chicago Board of Trade and various places and install software and teach financial traders how to use a computer. Yes, this was back in the 80s. And back then, I was also asked to demonstrate and teach people how to use my dad's software. Now, these were people that had never touched a computer before. So you can imagine how terrified they were. And what I learned, I learned the hard way. So today I'm gonna to share with you everything that I've learned over the last 30 years of doing software demonstrations so that you don't have to learn the hard way. Who needs to learn how to present software? Well, anyone looking to increase their performance in technology. IT professionals, that's you. You guys need to learn how to show and influence people to love your solutions. You spend so much time building it, they may as well love it, right? Functional areas that are looking to deploy new tools. Agile project teams, as you may know, agile methodologies require a demonstration at the end to show what you've created during that sprint. Consultants absolutely need to know how to demonstrate software and anyone looking to give funding for a project. Today, you're gonna to discover the secrets and best practices of pre-sales and software demonstrators. The art of explaining advanced concepts to non-techie executives how to tell a story so people remember what you're talking about, how to engage your audience, how to get funding with your presentation, and how to gain confidence and respect. Those of you that stay with me for the whole time of this presentation, at the end, I'm gonna give you a website to go to where you can sign up to get a free copy of my best-selling book, Business Intelligence Bullseye. I promise it's a quick, fun read and it's gonna teach you how to engage your business users and really define what they want in your systems. So I gave you a little bit about my story. I grew up in the software industry and I learned the hard way. So I remember this day when I was on a trade floor, basically we're at a trade show and I was supposed to man the booth. Now, some of you may have done this in a previous life or maybe you're doing it now. And I had to show them how to use the software. Now, the first time I did it, I quickly jumped in and started to click it and tell it, you know, what to do, showing them all the cool trends that the software could do. And they looked at me like I had horns coming out of my head. Have you ever been that way? Like you're showing software and the people just look at you like you're crazy. Well, I learned something. I learned that I was speaking a foreign language to them. To me, it was really easy. It was what I grew up with, right? But to them, to people that are not technology savvy, this is very scary. What I discovered the truth to be is that I need to change how I spoke. I needed to speak in their language. So I started to listen to the questions that they had. And more importantly, I listened to the exact words that they used when they asked the questions. And what I found is when I spoke in their language, it was game changing. Do you realize that you scare a lot of people? <laughs> yes, I'm serious. For those of us that are advanced in technology and we love this stuff, we get really excited, but we 
don't realize is that oftentimes we scare people that don't understand this. In fact, we do it so much that we make them feel stupid. Remember a time when you kind of felt like maybe you didn't understand something? Maybe you sat in a meeting and people started using a bunch of acronyms and you had no idea what they were talking about. How did you feel? Think about that emotion where you're like, whole time thinking, what are they talking about? What does that mean? And then once somebody actually cued you in to what that acronym meant, you suddenly were like, whoo, okay, now I'm back in the game. I can understand what they're talking about. Well, that's how your end users are feeling when you're demonstrating software. So today I'm gonna to teach you tricks on how to make them feel comfortable. And in turn, they're gonna like you a lot more. And by the way, one of the key factors of influence is people actually liking you. How many of you actually prepare for a big presentation? And how do you feel when you present or prepare for that big presentation? Are you scared? Are you nervous? Are you thinking, oh my gosh? Or do you think, hey, I know the software, I'm good. Well, that's what most people think is like, I know the software, I don't need to prepare. And I'm gonna teach you today that that is not the truth. In fact, that's as far from the truth. Many of you know so much about the software that you're actually doing your end users a disservice because you're scaring them with too much information. And why are presentation skills so important? Well, we want to increase end user adoption across the board with all systems. And being able to present and making them feel comfortable and not feeling like they're stupid is so important. We want to secure funding for our projects and do more phases. And to do that, we have to get people excited about what we're doing. And more importantly, teach them what's in it for them. Yeah, what I mean here is what's in it for your end users? How are they going to benefit from your solution? We need to show the results of all your hard work. And we want to give you the opportunity to look like a rock star personally. I've had many clients that I've worked with, and when they learn and practice this methodology, they actually end up getting promoted. And that's what I want for all of you as well. Now, we know that the Agile methodologies require a demonstration at the end of each sprint. So why not refine the skills if every sprint's going to require you to show something? And finally, you need to be able to sell your ideas internally. And I actually think this is probably the most important piece because I feel that a lot of business intelligence and IT professionals are struggling to be influential. It is my passion to help you guys learn the skills of influence so that we can literally change the world with data and analytics. Think about how many areas of life can be improved with better research from better data and analytics. The challenge we have though, is not getting off the ground because we're not as influential as we need to be. Myth number one, I know what they need and want. I hear this a lot from clients. They'll say, Heather, you know, I don't need to meet with my end users. I know what they want. I know what they asked for in the past. And the reality is you're not good at reading their minds. In fact, your crystal ball probably doesn't really work. Now, here's the big thing about this. What they think they want will change. So how are you supposed to read their minds if they don't even know what they want? What we need to do and how we can demonstrate software better is making sure they're engaged in the process and being able to discover requirements with them. That also requires framing and framing is the art of setting expectations and asking and having them engaged in the process. And then if something's going south or something's changing, we need to let them know along the way. It's that constant communication and not assuming. You know what the acronym ASSUME stands for, right? An ass out of you and me. So don't assume. It is the death of your dashboard. Myth number two, I know the software and I don't have time to practice. And this is a true story. I have a client that they were actually doing a reverse acquisition. Like the smaller company was buying up the big company. The small company was in the Midwest. The big company was in California. And the smaller company used the Cognos solution set. The parent, the bigger company used a different competitive tool. So of course it was a little bit of a turf war, right? 
Have you guys ever experienced this? So the smaller company in the Midwest was going to fly to California and show them how cool their Cogno stuff was. And their Cogno stuff was cool. So I asked them, I said, have you prepared? Do you want to do a dry run? And they looked at me like crazy, like, why would we do that? And I said, guys, you are maybe giving the biggest presentation of your life to these people and you want them to choose what you have, right? And I said, yeah. I said, so I get that you prep the data to show them, but what about the practice? And making sure that you've kind of outlined the key things that you want to show and objection handling. And so identify what they're going to say. They literally started laughing. They're like, oh my God, we never even thought about practicing. So make sure that practice is actually more important than prepping the data because you want to be very succinct in your presentation. You want to make sure you hit on certain factors. And, and when they say yes, or I love it, that's when you shut up. Uh, so many people do software demonstrations and they just keep going and going and going. And it, it's like the people already said they loved it and they're excited and they, they're in. Stop talking. Myth number three, our users don't care and don't pay attention. Well, here's the thing. If you think your users don't care, you're wrong. They do care. They want better tools. They just don't want to feel stupid in selecting those better tools. So typically when your users are acting like they don't care or they don't pay attention when you're presenting, you've already lost them. You've not engaged your audience and you've talked over their head. And that's why they're suddenly looking at their phones and checking their Facebook accounts. So I always say that communication is a two-way street. Communication isn't me talking to you. It's me talking to you and you understanding what I'm saying. If we don't have that two-part test to that, it's not communication. So if I was sitting here talking to you in Chinese and you didn't understand it, we would not be communicating. Same with technology and explaining technology concepts. I want to introduce you to my mom, Susie. She's the one in the purple. Doesn't she look like her dog? I mean, seriously, they have the same look at their face. So anyway, yes, I'm going to introduce you to my mom because she's really, really bright, but not when it comes to technology. I don't know about you guys, but does anyone else have a mom that you made the mistake of telling her that you could remote access her computer and fix it? You know, I made the mistake a while back and now my mom's always like, can you just do that little Zoom thing and fix my computer? If you haven't disclosed that to your mom, don't, because she'll call you all the time. But my mom is, like I said, she's very bright in certain ways, not when it comes to computers or technology. And so I always use her as an example because when I'm building a solution or I'm presenting a concept, my mom, Susie, has to understand it. If I were presenting and Susie didn't get it, then I've not done my job to make the complex concepts simple. So as you're presenting, think about your mom or maybe your dad or someone you know that's very bright in certain ways, but it's not technology and make sure they'd understand your technology. The fact of the matter is most of us have never had demonstration training. I don't know about you, but I studied finance and computer science in undergrad, and my goal was to sit and be able to work with numbers and code and not talk to people. Yeah, we'll see how that worked out for me, right? <laughs> anyway, I never had a class in demonstrating software. In fact, they didn't have them. They had speech communication classes where you had to get up and talk about walking beans. Yeah, I went to school in Iowa, but they never showed you how to actually present software. So it's not your fault. But here's the great news. Are you ready for this? This is this is going to make your day. Most of us are in some form of IT or finance, right? And the expectation of someone demonstrating software is really low. When you're in IT, think about your expectation of an IT person standing up there and demonstrating. It's like so low. It's like barely off the floor low. So you can only rock it. With a little practice, you can only be a superstar because they have really low expectations. So that should give you some comfort when you're practicing for your demonstration. So what do you fear most? 
Believe it or not, public speaking is one of the number one most feared topics. It is more feared than death itself. So when you're thinking about doing public speaking, you may get that hot flash of sweat, you might get the light breathing where you're gasping for air. But here's the thing, everybody fears this at some level. And so when they see you on stage, they're rooting for you. They want you to win. And so again, the whole room is looking at you, not like, oh, what's this guy gonna say? But what are they going to do and how are they gonna do it? And, and they want you to be a champion and, and do it well. 74% of people suffer from speech anxiety. Are you boring your audience? This is the number one thing you have to think about when you're presenting is to engage them and not bore them. Now, there's something that I call show up and throw up, and that's when a software person or a technologist comes and they show you every bell and whistle, every feature functionality of the software. Now you've been there before, I'm sure, when they just keep going, you're like, oh my gosh, there's so many buttons they're clicking. And you can tell your audience is experiencing this when their eyes start to roll back in their head or they start really looking at their phone. So do not do a show up and throw up. And how you avoid this is make sure you understand their needs and what they need to see to consider it a win or consider the sprint awesome or to give you funding. You don't wanna show them everything. You wanna just show them what they need to make the decision that it's great or that they, they're gonna fund it or that they're gonna buy that solution. Feature functionality overload will overwhelm your audience, even if you rocked it. So what's gonna happen is when they start nodding their heads like they're good, that you've satisfied all their requirements, that's when you stop talking. So you wanna typically have more prepared, but only present some of it. So if they ask more detailed questions, you can go there, but you don't offer it to them. A monotone voice. I have worked with one of the world's greatest speech coaches, which I know you're probably like, really, you? But um, his name is Roger Love, and he taught like Reese Witherspoon how to sing and all these famous people that were actors that couldn't sing. But he also teaches people that do a lot of public speaking. And one of the things he tells you is to use your voice like a melody. You don't want to talk monotone. You don't want to say, here's how we click on this. And this is how the business intelligent report generates. You want to add variety to your voice. And that can be done in pitch. That can be done in speed. That can be done in volume. So what I like to say is... You want to present like you're going to read a storybook to your child. Like remember when your kids were young and you're reading them a, a storybook and you're using the animated voices and, and you're giving it a lot of zest. That's how you want your presentations to be as well. You want to accentuate certain things and then maybe make things a little softer. So use your voice like a melody. Don't forget to include your audience. Now, I'm gonna teach you one of the greatest things I learned. I learned this at a World's Greatest Speaker Academy and it's called Bounce. Here's how it works. You wanna include your audience into your presentation. You wanna bring their life stories into your presentation by simply asking them, have you ever, so, have you ever had a boss that, it, when they ask for something, they start pacing back and forth in front of your office waiting for it. Now, everybody's kind of thinking about a boss that they had. Or do you remember when you were a child and you did something wrong and your parent really came down on you? Now, right now, everyone's thinking about a parent and they're thinking about something they did. So what I'm doing, I'm essentially bringing you into my story and then connecting the dots. Here's a perfect exam example of this. I was presenting to Nokia years ago when Nokia was this huge conglomerate and I was presenting to the CFO of the international organization. And I use an analogy, and we'll talk about analogies in a moment, but I use an analogy. I said, has anyone thought about or has built a house? 
Like, you know, your dream house. Now, wouldn't it be great to have a house that could grow and shrink based on your family's needs? You know, you're the single guy, so it's this great bachelor pad. And then you meet the girl of your dreams and it builds into this cute little house with a nice yard. And then you have kids and so a couple extra bedrooms appear. And then the kids now are driving, so the garage gets bigger. And then they go away and it shrinks back down. Wouldn't it be awesome to have this dynamic house for your planning information? And so I was doing... Um, basically a planning application, a budgeting planning system for them. And I was giving this analogy and bringing them into the story about what they would want in this house. Now, about two hours later, we take a break and the CFO comes up to me and says, how did you know I was building a house? Right? At that point, I knew we had him. Like that was like, I had him. He's in my story, totally listening. So you want to make sure you bounce. Now, here's the thing. I like to bounce about every three minutes in my presentation. Now you can typically tell by kind of the look on the people's face when they start to get a little glossy eyed, bounce, bring them back into your story. And it really, it's simple. Have you ever, do you remember when, and you keep the, the story somewhat generic. Like I don't say, do you remember when your mom was really mad at you? I say parent. So people can fill in the dots with their story. Add color to your presentations. It's amazing by simply adding a little color, a little images to your presentation, it will add life to it. And there's this website called Pixaby, P-I-X-A-B-Y, I believe, maybe A-Y, Pixabay, Pixaby. Anyway, that website is where you can get images that are basically free for you to utilize. And some of them require you just to give kind of a notation saying who it is. Most of them, however, don't. So you can put them in your presentations like this slide to add some color to it. So go out there, get yourself some images. You do want to be careful with images, however, in that if you grab them just off the internet, inter you do want to be careful, however, if you just go to the internet and grab some pictures, there's copyrights on those pictures. So you want to make sure you go to a website where you can use them properly for which you are using it. And that's why I use Pixabay. Now, the first thing we're going to start with is a framework for demo success. Now, I always say that the most important ingredients is knowing your audience, knowing what they want and what their expectation is for your presentation. Once you know your audience, you're going to develop your storyline and you're going to create literally a storyline like a day in the life of, and then you're going to actually do your demo. So you see the demo part of it is the smallest, but it's just the peak. It's the kind of like icing, icing on the top. So the audience, what we want to know is who's going to be there. Who's the most important person in the room? How do they think? what's important to them, and even how do they make decisions. Then you're gonna look at telling a story. And I've used a couple stories already because people remember stories. This is how history for millennia has been passed down is in the form of a story. So use the stories and make it so people remember you. We wanna then foresee objections, and this is really important. If you can stop and say, what are they going to object to this? Why wouldn't they give this project funding? What will they not like? And you do that beforehand, you're going to do this little bounce thing and you're going to say, now you may be thinking, but Heather, I just don't have time to do all this prep work. But in reality, do you see what I just did? I addressed your objection, like the voice in your head. When we do that and we actually pose it that way of you may be thinking what we're doing is one, we're pulling you into our story and two, we're creating this different connection. We're actually messing with people's brain chemistry, right? When people connect, when I'm actually saying what you're thinking, you're more than likely going to like me more. It's going to create these neuron transmitters that actually form bonds. And so you want to do that. So use that as often as possible to handle objections. Practice, practice, practice. I can't emphasize that enough. And then what so many people forget is the call to action. 
The call to action is you telling them specifically what you need them to do. Maybe it's, I need you to approve funding for this by a certain date. Or maybe I need you to give us a check mark saying that this project was successful. Whatever it is, so many people do a demonstration and then they just stop and they walk out of the room and everyone's like, oh, that was great. But they forgot to tell people what the next step is. So absolutely make sure that in your presentations, there's always a call to action. Okay, let's get into the audience a little bit deeper here. So who's attending and what do they care about? I always say there's two pains that everyone has. There's the internal pain and the external pain. So an example would be an external pain is the report data is wrong, right? That's external, we just see that's a problem. The real pain and the real reason the external, uh, the external pain exists, why the data is wrong, is that we don't have a proper data warehouse. So in my organization, we call this the skinny gene problem. So hypothetically, let's say I was a life coach and you came to me and you said, hey, Heather, I can't get my skinny jeans. So you think your problem is your jeans or your pants don't fit anymore, right? I know that most people ha don't have an issue with their pants not fitting, uh, but it's really stress eating might be the, the real issue. But if I tried to market myself as a life coach specializing in stress eating, you're probably not going to either find me or care to work with me because you're like, that's not me. I just have a little problem with my pants not fitting. And we all know it's not really the dryer, right? How many of you actually wish that it was the dryer that kept shrinking your pants? I don't I keep blaming it on the dryer. My boyfriend's like, yeah, no, that's not the problem. <laughs> so my real pain, then the external pain is the skinny jeans. How you fix it is the internal pain. So you want to know both when you're talking about your audience. You want to know what they think the problem is, the external pain, and you want to then address the real pain, and that is maybe no data warehouse or you have data management issues or what have you. The next thing that you're going to do is once you know who the audience is and what they care about, you're going to do a requirements discovery. This is essential. So many people say, oh, we do requirements gathering. And I hate that term because you, that assumes they already exist, that people actually know what they want. And you're just, they're like blueberries and you just go pick them somewhere, right? It doesn't work that way. The discovery means that maybe your end users aren't sure what they need. Maybe we need to have some discussion and give some, them some ideas on that. And the absolute best way to do this, and this is so simple to do, is to get everybody in the room, get them together before your demonstration, if you can. And what you're going to do is you're going to give everyone a stack of sticky notes and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to set a timer, maybe for 10 minutes, and everybody that's going to write what they want in this system or what they want in this demonstration or what they want to see on a sticky note. And they're going to write them all. The timer is really important because if you've ever had, let's say all day Saturday to clean your house, how long does it take? All day Saturday, right? Maybe even a Sunday too, if you find a good book or something. But if you get that text message and they're like, hey, Heath, I'm coming over in an hour, what happens? I don't know about you, but I run around the house like a mad woman and I throw things in closets and the dog is like, woo, what's going on? But I can clean my entire house in less than an hour. But if I have all day to do it, it's gonna take me all day. So we wanna do rapid requirements discovery and get people to put down their ideas. Now, here's the thing. People always change their mind, so you're never gonna be right. You're never gonna have all the requirements. And so why not do it quickly? I had one client, I taught them this, and the CIO called me up and said, Heather, we just had these executive strategy meetings and we were in them for days. And I know if we would have just used your sticky note exercise, we would have been done in a day instead of a week. So try this. It really does work. I'm starting to think that we need to get rid of this term active listening. And the reason is because I think we shouldn't just be listening, but we should be actively observing and 93% all communication is nonverbal. So we need to see people to do this. 
But with active listening, we want to stop solving their problems. So this is kind of a, a defect that many of us high political people have is that when someone says, here's my problem, we go into solution mode. Right? I don't know. Do you guys do this? Like suddenly your brain's like, oh, we have this data in SQL and oh, we have some of this in Excel and I can bring it together and here's how we're going to do it. Right? You start solving the problem and you, you stop listening. You literally can't hear anything that the rest of the stuff that they're telling you is a problem. And so when we go into a meeting, we have to literally turn our brains off and say, no solving the problem. You can only ask questions and observe. And then you can solve the problem and start to create the solution in your brain after you leave the room. To do this, one of the best things you can do is repeat what they told you. So Bob, what I'm hearing you say is, and then I reiterate it. What this does is it not only makes sure that I actually heard him, but it also opens the door for them to say, oh, but I forgot to tell you. And I gotta tell you, that happens all the time as consultants or consultants and lawyers, they never want to hear, did I tell you? Because that really means that your end users never told you and they're about to drop a bomb on you or on your project, right? So make sure you repeat that. Try to demonstrate on paper first. Now, this is very important and I'm going to explain to you a concept I call your baby's ugly in a moment. But the idea is get your pencils or pan I like to use those Crayola markers. Um, or what's really cool is get the smelly ones. Those are kind of fun. Like the blue is blueberry and the purple is grape. And you have them actually start to draw. Now color turns on the creative size side of our brain. So that's pretty important. But more importantly, you want them to draw what they think they need in your solution. Now you do this before your demonstration to make sure that you can demonstrate their expectation. Now, if, if you can't demonstrate, maybe that's not what the solution does, you can reframe it and say, you know what, in this phase, we haven't done that yet, but that's great input. Go on camera if you're virtual. I love this one to have connections so I can see people. It allows them to see you and you to see them creating a much better connection. Remember, 93% of all communication is nonverbal. That crumple forehead when someone looks at you funny means I don't get it. You need to go back, slow things down, explain it in another way. Now here's the biggest thing thing I see in data and analytics are, what are your strategic goals for the company? Most people I work with when I survey the classes that I teach and present to, most people can't tell me what the strategic goals of their company is. Now here, let's think about this. Let's say you're a business intelligence professional. Your job is to deliver kick butt reports and dashboards and all the cool stuff, right? Now, the goal is to create this cool stuff to help the company achieve their strategic goals. But does anyone else realize that you don't even know what those strategic goals are? Like, think about it. That's like you going to run a marathon and the executives never told you where the race was, where the start was, or where the finish line or the course, and yet they expect you to finish in record time. So you want to make sure that you are not like most of the people that I work with initially. Believe it or not, less than 4% of business intelligence professionals can answer this question when I survey them. I don't want you to be one of them. So your homework is to go and ask, what are the strategic goals? Now, when you do this, I'm going to warn you, the first time you do it, they're going to look at you kind of like you're a unicorn or something, like there's a big horn coming out of your head. And then they're going to be like, Ooh, I want this person on my team, but they will be a little shocked that you don't know. And then they're going to be like, Oh wait, how would they know? So just be prepared for that. Now I talked about your baby's ugly, and this is also called the pictures worth a thousand words. Here's how this rolls. Has anyone else had a friend or a relative that has a baby and you're like, Oh my gosh, that is like the ugliest baby ever. Right? I have this friend, um, I, I won't tell you their name, <laughs> but they had this baby. I swear to God, it looked like a troll doll. Like it had this bright orange hair and it had these big hands and it looked like a troll doll. I mean, cute in an ugly kind of way, right? <laughs> and 
did anyone say your baby's ugly? No, they're like, oh, wow, isn't he look fun? Or he looks cute, right? And that's somewhat sarcastic cute. But the reason they don't do it is because you can't do anything about it, right? Now, here's what most people try and do. They try and immediately demonstrate their software, their solution, even if it's in prototype phase and you're trying to get funding, they do it in the software. And I'm gonna tell you, stop doing that. What you wanna do is get out the markers, get out the crayons, I don't care what you use. You could even print little graphs or charts that come out of Cognos or whatever tool you're using, and you're going to make it creative. You're gonna let them draw their diagrams how they wanna see the data. And the reason for this is because when you develop it in the software solution, even if it's just Excel to mock it up, they think that you've put a lot of work into it and then it's already done. They're not gonna tell you your baby is ugly if they think you put a lot of work into it. Now, if it's on white paper, they think you haven't done anything and they will start designing and drawing exactly what they want. What happens now is you're not guessing what they want. You don't need a crystal wall. You have their documents. Now, I would keep that little sketch, and when you deliver that solution and it looks just like their sketch, if they come back and say, well, that's not really what I want, you whip out that piece of paper. You're like, really? Because last week you sketched this for me, and that's what I thought you wanted. It's, it makes it actually quite entertaining when they try and backtrack from that. And they're like, oh, I guess I did tell you that because they will change your, their minds. So you don't want to be a victim to that. Now, you also want to tell a story. Remember, people remember stories. And so you're going to start to use a lot of analogies. You're going to start with the pain you are solving in the eyes of your audience. You're going to get this from your requirements discovery process that we did with the sticky notes where they give us our ideas. You're going to start at the end of the story. So today I'm going to show you how we're going to have these amazing dashboards that will allow you to see blah, 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 right? And then you're actually, when you're demonstrating, I always start at the end as well. So if I'm demonstrating, for example, Cognos Analytics or Cognos BI, I'm going to show them the end report and then maybe I'll build it so that they, they know what we're building up to. So many times I see people like, well, this is how you would build a report. And they forgot to show them the, the picture of what the results would look like, and they kind of lose their audience. So start with the end of the story and the wins and how that's gonna be really beneficial, and then show them how that's actually built. Learn to bounce, we talked about this. Bounce is a practice. You can do this in your everyday life. Do it with your friends. Do you remember when or have you ever? Those are kind of the key intro phases to any times you're bouncing. Use your voice as an instrument. We talked about Roger Love and, and being able to like use it as a melody. So volume, speed, pitch, all of that. Now leverage analogies. I'm a huge analogy person. And I've kind of conditioned my brain to only think in analogies. It's kind of annoying after a while because I'm always saying it's like, and I use it. And what we want to do with analogies is compare something complex to something in their everyday life. I used the example earlier of building a house and a dynamic house that could grow and shrink based on your family needs. Now that's because it's a simple topic and almost everybody is has either wanted a house or thought about building a house or has lived in a house, they can all relate to it. So start to use analogies. Now, here's the great thing. Listen to your coworkers, listen to salespeople use analogies and borrow them. Any story I use, I always say, I'm wrapping that up as a gift and you can use it with your audience, with your people in your organization as well. So if you get stuck and you're like, Heather, I got this tough, complex concept. I don't know how to describe it. Let me know and we can come up with an analogy together. Now remember less is more. So know going into it what your goal is to get them to agree to something and know what the key things they need to see 
in order to agree to it and show them just that. Do not offer more if they ask for specific things and you've already built credibility, yes or no are good answers. So, so many times people think that when they demo software that they have to show everything that people ask. If you've already shown that you're credible and you know your stuff, then when they ask a question, a simple, yes, we can do that without showing them anything is perfectly fine. So here's a little kind of storyline I like to use. And by the way, this is the same process that they use for every Hollywood blockbuster, right? I have a friend who he, he actually works with like Will Smith to write, help him write his screenplays. And this is the process that they follow. So there's a crisis, something that is not working, some information that salespeople don't have something. And then there's a challenge. Like if we could only solve this problem, and then there's competition. Competition could be for time. It could be for, you know, could be external competition. And then, oh, but if we could provide this dashboard, what is going to happen, right? And then that's where we kind of turn. And now we say, well, today I'm going to show you how we can get there. And you start to show them, you show them the end result. I'm going to show you how we can get to this dashboard. And then I'm going to actually show them how we built it maybe. And then, as you know, we've shown you how this demonstration, uh, how we could get this information so that our salespeople can sell $1.2 million more in product and make us a lot of money, right? See how you kind of take that through the process. And then at the end, you're going to ask for the call to action. So today I need funding for this project, right? Now the objection handling we talked about a little bit earlier, super, super important. You wanna go through your audience and look at each person in, in particular, who's the really important person, the decision maker, and what objections will they have? So the CFO might say, I get the reports I need. Why do I need to spend money on a new solution? So you're saying, you know, you might be thinking, I already get the reports I need. Why are we sitting here watching this, this demonstration? And I totally understand it, but it currently requires significant hours to compile those reports. And maybe they're not as accurate as they need to be. And you start to handle that objection, right? And maybe the IT manager says, I don't know if our end users are ready to handle advanced tools. And so in your presentation, you would be saying, you know, you might be thinking, are our users really tech savvy enough to handle these type of tools? And the reality is the trick to helping people adapt to new technology is proper training. We have a whole outline on how we're going to handle the training. So bottom line, address the conversation in their head. Now the call to action is what do you want them to do? I want you to approve this project and fund it by such and such date. I want to, you know, purchase this software by such and such date, whatever it is, make sure it's very concise and clear. And you also include when you want them to do it by, otherwise it leaves it open ended. You want to have a call to action that actually gets action and who needs to be involved. So do we need to go to capital committee to get this funding? and find out who needs to be involved and what that process is. And then, so based on what I'm hearing, I believe these are the next steps. And in that meeting, I always validate what I think the next steps are because there's always one that pops up that we weren't expecting. Remember, failure to practice is practicing to fail. The biggest thing you can do is do the time. Record yourself and score yourself. Now, I personally, I'm actually recording this today with a product called Camtasia. Camtasia is by TechSmith. You can get a free 30-day trial copy, I believe, online. Super, super easy to use. It can record your camera. It can record your screen, your voice. And here's the cool thing. When you screw up, all you have to do is just pause and be quiet and then start that section over again. So you can edit out uh, your, on your video. So I use this for training, for videos, for everything, but I also use it to practice. So I record myself and here's something you got to know when you play it back, it's horrible. It is so painful to listen to yourself. 
you'll start to learn and hear your nuances. Like some of us go, um, all the time. I personally am a sewer, so I'm like, so... But you'll start to notice that. And the best way to solve those kind of problems is to hear them and note them on your own recording. So record yourself to practice. Go on camera. I think this is really important is to go ahead, get yourself on camera so you see the nuances. Some people really uh, kind of play with jewelry or they twirl a wing or something. So find out what your little mannerisms are. Do a dry run with your colleagues. This really helps if you want a more interactive environment. I love when there's a change from a male voice to a female voice and back and forth because it really kind of wakes everybody up and gets them more engaged. You'll also want to have a wingman. And what this is, is a wingman is someone on your team that is your wingman. So if something happens, which by the way, it will at some point if you do enough demos, is going to help move the audience to look somewhere else. So my wingman is typically in the back of the room. And if my computer dies, I get the blue screen of death, something happens or the system's crashing, my wingman will be in the back of the room and they will start talking and adding value. They'll be like, well, this is what we're thinking of. And what's gonna happen is everyone in the room then is going to turn and face the person talking. That gives me some time to fix whatever's blowing up on my laptop and make it so that they're not all watching me try and fix it and freaking out. So this also is important when you have remotely connected groups. So if you're doing a virtual demo, you'll want a wingman in each location so they can say, hey, Heather, I think here in Austin, we have some questions. So make sure you have your wingman. I believe in scoring everything Literally, I score everything. It's kind of um, a sickness I have, I think. But I have a demo scorecard that I'd be happy to share with you that gives you some categories. Now, I believe if you really want to get good at this, when you're doing an internal demo in your company, to ask a few people and say, you know, I'm really trying to improve my presentation techniques. Do you mind having a scorecard and filling it out and giving me some feedback on how I did? And that, that, they're going to be surprised by that, but your speaking will go to a whole nother level if you start scoring it. Here's some tips to build your confidence. Confidence is everything, especially when you're sitting up in a room full of 50 people staring at you. And I believe in this thing called make your move. So I know if you're listening at home or at the office, I want you to do this with me right now. What you're going to do is you're going to put your body in the position that you would do. It's kind of your victory pose. Now, for me, I usually do this thing where I put my hands up in the air and I kind of, and my legs are kind of wide apart. So I look like I'm the letter H. Um, so it's kind of my victory pose. And you'll probably see that in some of my presentations. Now, Think about maybe you play golf or, and you're on the putting green and you have a 20 foot putt to win a million dollars. And you stand there, you line it up, you tap it, it rolls, it rolls, it goes around the rim and it goes in. You just won a million dollars. Now make your move. And so on the count of three, one, two, three, yes. Now, if you hold that pose, what will actually happen is your body is going to have a biological response. I am messing with your brain chemistry. I am flooding it with feel good chemicals. And all you have to do is make your move and hold that pose for about 60 seconds and it will completely build you with confidence. Now we did this live in the live event and I had the whole room stand up and they were all making their move. And then you look around the room and everyone has the biggest grin on their face. Maybe they're feeling a little awkward, but I gotta tell you, they're feeling good. So I know it's kind of weird to do, like you get this room full of people and you're standing up there making your move. So don't do that. What you wanna do is maybe go into the restroom, find a stall and just make your move before your presentation flood your body with positive, confident chemicals, and you're gonna go on and it's gonna be game changing for you. Anytime you have a big presentation, I'm a big make your move fan. We also know that 
practice is going to give you the confidence. If you go through and you absolutely do the objection handling exercise, you will be so ready to handle that presentation. Know your storyline. Like the, I like to do kind of a day in the life of, and I, I pretend that I'm one of the characters kind of using the solution. I also recommend that you have a PowerPoint a screenshots of what you're gonna present. Like if you're doing live software demonstration, Murphy's Law will kick in, something will crash. So what you wanna do is have screenshots of your PowerPoint presentation so that you could literally say, guys, clearly we're having some system issues, some network issues, but guess what? I have a backup plan and I'm gonna show you in PowerPoint and you pull it up and you show them through that. And what happens, even if the top executive in your company is in the room, they're gonna be really impressed by your resilience, by the fact that you had a backup plan. They're gonna be like, you know what? That is somebody I want on my team. The next part of this is have a recording of your demo. You could use Camtasia to record your practice and maybe make a really good practice. So if something happens, you could always play that recording. And imagine that, that's your get out of jail card, right? The system, you didn't waste people's time, you still look good. Now here's a trick though, you wanna have a copy of that PowerPoint presentation and probably your recording on someone else's laptop. So if your laptop crashes, you still are gonna look good. When people, when stuff happens, they don't look at you like, oh my gosh, they're crashing and burning. They're looking at how are they gonna recover? And you're gonna have so much more, they'll have more admiration for you when you recover. Now remember, assign your wingman too, because they're gonna help you build that confidence if something does happen. Now I always like to say, hey, you have to be prepared to survive the disaster demo. And the first thing is don't highlight your mistakes. If you were going to present something and that piece of the functionality of the software is not working, don't even mention it unless they specifically ask for it. They don't know what you're gonna present. So don't highlight that something's not working, just move on. I see to so many times, and I think I saw it all the time, where people are like, well, today this isn't working. And I'm like, just don't even mention it. Just move on. When you do have to fix things, if you can, cover your screen. Sometimes this is very difficult because the projector could be very high in the ceiling. That's why your wingman behind you is going to talk. Remember, wingman belongs in the back of the room. If it gets really bad, call a timeout. Just say, you know what guys, I think clearly we have some network issues or something we need to solve. Do you think we could take a 10 minute break and just call a timeout? You look much better giving them time to check their email or grab a cup of coffee or a potty break, right? Or something instead of them staring at you where you will be sweating bu just bullets, right? I've been there, just call a timeout, give yourself a breather. Remember, PowerPoint or a video will help you get through that, that demo disaster. And then have that on someone else's laptop. Now, there's also an art to a virtual demonstration. Now, many of you have users all over the world and you wanna be able to address that. The first thing is know your technology. If you're using Zoom, know how to use it. Know how to make sure that you mute everyone else's mics if you need to do that, if you have a lot of people on it. I was at a demonstration a few years ago and I swear to God, somebody would like that, they didn't mute the audience and somebody, one person was making a dentist appointment, forgot to mute his phone, and the other guy literally was going into the bathroom. Like, we don't want to hear that. So know your technology, know how to mute your other users, know how, tell them how to use the technology when you start. Get a good microphone. Now I'm using a Shure microphone here. It's a very nice microphone with what we call a pop filter. A pop filter is this little, it's like a little mesh thing. It looks like something your mom would have done needlepoint in. And then it's got cloth over it that helps clarify the P's and the S's when you're talking. If you're gonna go on camera, which I do recommend, Watch out for the camera angle. Now on my laptop, the camera, I love this laptop by Dell, but they put the camera in just the worst place. It's like on the lower part of the screen on the right, on the left hand side. So if I don't prop it up on a bunch of books or on a stand, it's completely the nostril shot. 
Nobody likes the nostril shot, guys. So make sure that you're not giving it. So you want to move your... Um, I always say move the image. If you can see yourself on the Zoom maybe or whatever you're recording in, move your image right above your camera because you have this habit of looking at yourself and then at least it looks like you're looking in the camera. You also want to look for your lighting. Uh, Well-lit lights, natural light from windows is the best. When I'm doing this in my office, sometimes I augment it with some other lighting, little LED lighting to brighten it up a little. And then watch your background. So you might have like all sorts of junk behind you that you don't want people to see if so just drape up like a sheet or something so they can't see it um also watch out for like children if you have small children i had one situation where a coworker literally had a naked small child running in the background um you don't want that either and size matters and that means on your screen make sure sometimes when you go through zoom or go to meeting or those it kind of shrinks it for the other people make sure the size is big enough for them to see the numbers and designate monitors at each location to be able to ask questions so oftentimes they'll mute you at the other location so you want to make sure you have a moder moderator that will then say hey heather i have a question I'm a big fan of checklists. I do checklists for everything. So I have a checklist that I can give you that's doing the demonstration, like research, the requirements, discovery, the checklist, the storyline, all of that. If you want this, um, when, you, when I give you the address to sign up for, I'll make sure we send all this out as well. So what are the typical results by practicing and following this methodology for demos? You're gonna get greater visibility, you're going to get more funding for your projects. You're going to gain respect within the organization because remember, most people are terrified of doing demonstrations. You'll get assigned to the interesting projects and you might even get a promotion. So when is now a good time to start? When you're looking to get funding and increase end user adoption, identify several business challenges that make or save the company money. We have a whole workshop on this uh, that we will be announcing new dates here shortly. And in that exercise, these pictures are actually people in our workshops working with sticky notes and, and starting to identify what business challenges can really make or save the company money. Then we teach them how to go through the sticky note exercise, how to do paper mockups, and even how to present with paper. We had one client that went through this and they identified a dashboard that they forecasted to make the company $1.2 million in increased recurring annual revenue. They were so excited that they left Tampa, they flew back home, and I'm pretty sure they flew onto the plane because they were so excited their feet weren't touching the ground. They got back, they presented it like we taught them to do, and the end result is they all got promoted and they really enjoyed their jobs a lot more. So if you're interested in our workshop, we have lots of references we can give you, but it's a really fun activity. We make sure it's fun and you learn a ton. So because you have been here with us this whole presentation, all you need to do is go to lodestarsolutions.com forward slash think 2019. There, you can enter in your information, and when you do so, you'll be able to download a free copy of my best-selling book, Business Intelligence Bullseye. But we will also give you copies of a requirements discovery checklist and some other extra items. You'll also get a copy of our other presentation that we gave at Think on how do you uh, design dashboards executives crave. So we love your feedback. Please share this video with your friends. Give me feedback. What did you love about it? What did you hate about it? I can only get better if you give me scores. And so please, let's connect. If you want, just email me at hcole at lodestarsolutions.com and let's make you guys software demonstration champions. I hope to see you on our next event. We'll be giving you new dates and new information coming shortly. Thanks and have a great day.